do they cancel work when it snows? I just wondered. I just, they do? do they can, would they cancel it on this, this kind of snow? Maybe. All right. I just wondered. Do they cancel work when it snows? Ah, uh, never mind. Don't want to talk about that. Hey, um, last week, last week, um, there was, um, we, we, we started or kind of, I just kind of brought to you um, the teaching on um, laying up treasures for yourselves, not on earth, but in heaven. So there's a passage of scripture that I'd like for you to look at right now. It's, it's found in Matthew chapter 6. We talked about this last week. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For your treasure is there will your heart be also. So last week we talked on, we gave you a little teaching on Jesus' teaching on how do we handle our treasures. And specifically, by the way, in Matthew chapter 6, the word treasures there has to mean uh, our finances, our resources, okay? So now I want to talk to you and teach you this morning on teachings from the Apostle Paul. How many of you know that the Apostle Paul wrote more than half of all the New Testament books? Do you know that? Right? So he had, he had a lot to say. And here's a passage of scripture that I want us to talk on this morning. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So if your Bible's 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, Here's what Paul says. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all what we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up for their treasures as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. All right, we'll dive into that text of scripture, a couple of things that I know that already is flagging you this morning. This morning. So let me give you context of what we've been talking about for the last four weeks. This is our last series, our deep dive into our mission statement that we mobilize passionate Mobilize and commission passionate followers of Jesus to encounter God, connect with others, and impact our world. We, we, for the last four weeks, we've been talking about how you and I can make an impact in the world that we live in, right? So we've talked about time. We talked about talents. Last week, we talked about treasures, all of which we use in order to build God's kingdom. So... The thing that we learned last week, the very first thing that I told you, some of you may not like this, but uh, it's the truth. God owns everything. Say that with me this morning. God owns everything. God owns everything. Especially if you're a follower of Jesus, you have to really understand this key principle that God owns everything. Why? Because Jesus is teaching in the New Testament, and we learned this last week, that he wants his followers, that means those who follow Jesus, have given their hearts to Jesus, he wants his followers to be faithful steward. And how many of you remember what a steward was? Last year I, I gave you a description of what a steward is. Anyone remember what a steward is? All right, great. This is like class. It's like, my, it's like when I teach high school students, the first question never gets answered because no one wants to say anything or they forgot yesterday's lessons, right? So a steward is someone who manages his master's goods, his master's resources, and his master's wealth. So a steward is someone who simply faithfully manages somebody else's stuff. 
So we know God owns everything. And because God owns everything, Jesus now teaches us that God requires you and I to be faithful stewards. We need to be one who faithfully manages the Lord's goods, the Lord's resources, and the Lord's finances. Now, why do we do that? Because it's important for us to understand that our life is but a vapor. It is here today and gone tomorrow. Well, fell, don't you, we live a long life. Yeah, for the most, we don't live like what they lived in the Old and New Testament, right? I mean, how many of you, who was the oldest man in the world? Methuselah, yes, correct. Uh, Methuselah was how many years old? 900 69 years, good, correct, for 10 points. Right? 969 years. Now, it's important for us to, to mine out, first of all, the New Testament, what Jesus teaches about how do we handle finances. This morning, we're going to talk about how Paul teaches this. How, do, how does the Apostle Paul talk to us about treasures, our our resources, our finances. Now, why is this important? Well, we talked to you about last week that ultimately everything that we do is done so that we lay up for ourselves, Jesus says, treasures in heaven where moth nor rust will destroy and where thieves break in, where thieves cannot break in and steal. So I don't want to go back over that teaching if you forgot it. Uh, go look on YouTube and, and listen to it. Now, let me give you a couple of things before we dig into uh, Paul's, uh, Paul's uh, letter to First Timothy. Uh, let me ask you this question. What do you think is the global individual median income of the world? Okay, global, around the world, individual, a person, and their median income, right? So middle average income of a person in all of the world. Okay, say, say it to me. Tw who said 20,000? Don says 20,000. Okay, anyone else? Uh, uh, Torrance raises 5,000, yes? 3,000, Janice. 1,600, ooh. Uh, Abram. Yes, 1,700. Oh, he wanted to one up you by 100. Yes, 500. You can't give me 500. 750. Thank you so much. Yes. Infinity, no, that's not track. Okay, yes, that's a good try. All right, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a, a uh, little... You could scan it if you want. I'm, I was pretty proud of this, David. This is almost like I'm like I was really. I, you could scan this. It'll, it'll give you to the link. If you want this, scan it. It'll give you to the link to the Washington Post. And the article is Americans vastly underestimate how rich they are compared to the rest of the world. Does it really matter? All right. So in this study by the Washington Post, they figured out that the global median income of the world is $2,100. $2,100. Let me give you, according to Data USA, um, you know, there's so many sites, but datausa.io. Let me give you the median. This is the difference, okay? This is global individual income versus the U.S. polls. U.S. data is global median income. So instead of one person, this is two people, the household, right? So the global, so the U, Lee Summit, your median household income in Lee Summit is $98,960. In Raytown, which is close to us here, is $59,000. Uh, $49. 
South Kansas City is $55,787. So if you, that's the area that we live in right now. So if you think about that, those numbers compared to the individual income of the world at $2,100 per person. Let me ask you this question. Would First Timothy be talking to us? Let me ask you this question. Would First Timothy be talking to us? I would suggest he's talking to us. And he tells us these words. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. Let me talk to you really quickly about some things Paul is trying to teach us today. The first thing I believe that Paul tells us is that he tells us that we should caution ourselves against trusting in wealth. Paul begins addressing to those who are rich in this present age, and he tells them, not to be haughty, not to be prideful, and not to place their ultimate hope in the uncertainty of riches. Instead, Paul says, their trust should be in God, who ultimately provides all things. So don't put your trust in wealth. Those of you that had a lot of money stored in your IRA in 2008 saw your IRA diminish probably by half. In less than a year, your finances took a hit because of the stock market. And in, in most across the board, that happened, right? Those of you, we, we read how major corporations can fundle and, and, and embezzle their employees' retirement and take it all away from them. This is nothing new, right? So understand don't put your trust in wealth. Rather, put your trust in God. Second thing that Paul tells us is this. Paul tells us to enjoy God's provision. So here, Paul acknowledges that God is the one who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. That's what Paul says. God is the one who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. What is, what is Paul trying to say? Paul is trying to say here, that he is not condemning those of us who are wealthy. Rather, he is saying that wealth is a gift from God to be enjoyed within the framework of being gratitude and having responsibility for the wealth that you, you and I have. We are to enjoy everything that God gives to us. So if you are making a ton of money, God says, enjoy it, but enjoy it within the framework of gratitude and personal responsibility, right? There is not a condemnation to the rich here, right? So Paul teaches us to enjoy God's provision. Sec third thing Paul teaches, Paul teaches us to do good and to be generous, the heart of Paul's message here in 1 Timothy is a call for all of us who are obedient to the voice of the Lord to be generous. He instructs those who are rich, the wealthy, to engage in good works, to be rich in acts of kindness, to be both generous and ready to share. And this, and this morning, Pastor Abram already shared with us the goodness of God through your willingness to be generous so that instead of just simply providing eight meals to Frida Markley, your generosity was able to give us enough to feed 13 families. So back in the day, remember back in the day, everyone, uh, this is a discussion with, uh, with Frida Markley, by the way, 
we thought, you know, we used to do this all the time. We would, we would tell people, bring in a turkey, and we would give turkeys away. Well, we found out at Freedom Arkley, just talking with their staff, they have families who, who even though they have, they may or may not have the capacity to even cook a turkey. So for us to give turkeys wasn't going to be beneficial. It wasn't going to help the families because those families who need the turkey couldn't even cook the turkey. So we said, well, what does that mean then? Could a fully prepared meal with all the t turkey already fixed? He goes, that would be better for us. So instead of providing turkeys this year, what we did was provided full meals so that we gave it to the families who, who desperately needed it, Lisa, and, and they didn't have to cook. They could just, they could just eat it. And, they, and, and I found out, you know, just, I'm, I, my, my mind just gets crazy when I start hearing these things. Some people don't have even the capacity to reheat the stuff. I mean, like, you and I, I don't think that's our world, is it? We're not in a world where we, 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 we use the microwave and stick it in the microwave and get it reheated. But we were talking to their staff, and they said some of them don't even have that capacity to do that. And I'm thinking to myself, wow. So Paul here in 1 Timothy is teaching us to be, to be generous and to do, good, to do good and to be ready to share. And this underscores, by the way, how important it is for us to be responsible with what God has given to us. This is the future, the foundation of building for yourselves and for me financial security that, encom that encompasses both spiritual and eternal blessings. Finally, the last thing Paul teaches us, and you, you notice how I, how I wanted to just keep going. Paul instructs us to truly grasp what life is. He calls it, by the way, true life. What is true life? Paul concludes by expressing this ultimate purpose for this kind of living. How, how do you live? Why do you live this way? In other words, Paul, true and meaningful life is found in a generous and God-focused life not in the accumulation of wealth for its own sake. So, why is this important? Well, it's important because there's some key lessons you and I need to learn. We need to have a proper perspective on wealth. God's not mad at you if you, if you have money. God's not, as a matter of fact, the reason why you have money is because he gave it to you. The reason why you have money is he gave it to you. I have friends, by the way. Uh, I won't tell you. I have friends. Um, one of my friends owns every McDonald's in the Northland. And I, t I, I tell him, I've had a conversation with him, and I, I told him, he and I are lifelong friends. We've been friends since high school. And I tell him, the reason why you are blessed is because God has seen your heart and he sees the generosity in your heart. And instead of this, you are this. So open your hands so that God can funnel blessings through you. We are merely conduits. We're merely conduits of what God chooses to give through us, whether it's time. Oh, by the way, let me talk to you about time, by the way. And this was not on. I'm off script now. Um, I just want to say a shout out to Nick and to Ed today. For the last month, maybe, they have been here and spent so much and have given so much time to put in our, our parking lot, to do all sorts of stuff, to do everything, that it is amazing the amount of time these guys have put in to, for this church, right? Now, let me talk to you about talent. You know, I, I love this story that Pastor Abram shared because it's the story of the five, the two, and the one. And I tell this, when I teach this story, I always teach it. Some people are five talented people, and God knows. 
Some people are two talented people, and God knows, and some people are simply just one talent people. And I hope that we learn that the one talent guy is just as important as the five talent guy, right? So, um, like David Stanley to me is a five talent guy. Like he he's 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 a humble dude, but he's he's not going to tell you that this dude is a is a, he's a five talent guy. He's got so many talents you'd not even know, and he's used every one of these talents, by the way, to help build this kingdom. Like you guys. He's painted this entire building. He's painted this entire building, not just the outside. He painted the out the not, I mean not just the inside but the outside as well. So this entire building has been painted by David Stanley. He's not going to tell you that. I tell I just told you that. Right. Why? Because he's used his talent to build God's kingdom. Now, why is this important? It's important for us today to understand that when we talk about treasures and finances and resources and all of that, some of us kind of like cringe. Because, oh, uh, gosh, dog, I mean, why could I come to the church and the, and, and the preacher's preaching on money? Well, it's important for us to understand that, first of all, God owns everything. <laughs> he owns it all. And Jesus tells us we ought to be faithful stewards of all that God has given to us. And we have to have a, what I call a new perspective on wealth. Wealth is a blessing in order for us to continue to build God's kingdom. I think about this. Think about, I always thought about this. I would, I've, and I've shared it with you on mul multiple occasions. I want us to be a church that we could give a million dollars away to missions. I want that. Every year, if everyone asks, hey, what's the income of the church? They look down the bottom line. This church just gave away $1 million to missions. How many, we, 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 if we look back, uh, some of you know that we support Calcutta Mercy Ministries. It's a ministry in Calcutta, India. They have a, a feeding program that feeds 25,000 kids every day. What would money to them, what would 100,000 mean to them to do that? How many more kids could they feed? How many more people could they touch? See, you and I don't have to be there, but we can partner with others who are doing it. And we've got, you know, we've got just the, this incredible blessing, right? So have to have a new perspective on wealth. We have to understand that the purpose of wealth goes far beyond our own enjoyment, but rather an opportunity for us to do good, to engage in acts of kindness, and to be generous. And ultimately, you and I need to have what I call an eternal perspective. Generosity and good works have an eternal impact. Some would say eternity. Do you know that your giving and your kindness and your goodness has an eternal impact. Um, let me figure out some things. I want to talk to you about these buckets. Time. Talent treasure, and kingdom. I'm going to suggest, folks, we are living our lives storing up for ourselves in each of these buckets. And until we're able to move ourselves away from these buckets and to put it in this last bucket, 
then we will miss what God's ultimate purpose for our lives. So one last thing, because uh, I shared with you last week uh, my story, and I'm going to share it again this morning. So I, uh, there's a picture coming up. One of my treasures, one of my treasures is my friend Ken Langham. Kenny Langham. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is uh, Gracie Hunt's Instagram post. For those of you that weren't here last Sunday, uh, I shared it because I, I, I follow her. And it just so happened my friend Kenny, who's worked, as I was corrected last week, over 40 years with the Kansas City Chiefs, 42 years, ma'am, 42 years. On February 2nd of 2020 on Super Bowl Sunday, his job, and, and those of you who knew Kenny because he was a longtime member of our church, um, um, traveled with the Chiefs every weekend and was at the stadium every weekend uh, of, of, of game day. And he was one of the security people that traveled with the team on their away games. So uh, today, they are at uh, Las Vegas. He would be traveling. He would be at Las Vegas. Um, anyway, um, he and I, I shared you with you the story. He and I had a week before the Super Bowl had a conversation. If we win, Ken, and we are going to win, when we win, Ken, I know you're going to be on the field. And when you get on the field, I need you to get me some confetti. That's all I want. I don't want anything else but confetti from the field. Yep. So, so I share, and it, this is a conversation he and I had. He goes, he goes, Pastor, how am I going to get the confetti? I said, well, get a Walmart bag. Get the Walmart bag, stuff the confetti in the Walmart bag, stick it in your, in your pocket, and you're good to go. And he, and if you notice, uh, this is Norma Hunt and Lamar kissing the Lombardi trophy, right, on the field of the Super Bowl. And if you notice, my friend Ken already has the, the Chiefs champions hat because they give it as soon as that happened, right? And if you notice, by the way, in, he has a, a uh, his other hat is upside down. If, I, if we were to enlarge this picture, it's upside down. And in that hat is all sorts of confetti. And I texted him, and I said to him, Ken, I see it. <laughs> and he responded back to me, yes, pastor, it's for you. Last week, I shared with you, uh, I, it was here, uh, Rose brought Ken's championship ring, Super Bowl 54 with, with the Kansas City Chiefs. And, and he, and you all know the story, he was not able to wear it because he passed away on, on July of, t June of 2020. He was not there when the ring was given. And um, a treasure that I'm sure Ken would have cherished while here on this earth. But it's not there. But this morning I have the treasure. It's got the Lombardi trophy. It's confetti with trophy. That, that's what they did. They made confetti and it looked like a championship trophy. And they blew it all over the field. And what I hold in my hand Micaiah, is confetti from February 2nd of 2020 when the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl. Let me ask you this question. How many people do you think have this? <laughs> Rose and I have it. 
right? So why I say this, by the way, what is confetti made out of? Paper. Paper. It's not made out of any valuable material. It's not diamonds. It's not precious metal. It's paper that's not worth anything. And in, if I did not have it in a Ziploc bag, what would happen to this? It would be destroyed. Yeah, I should label the Ziploc bag. Thank you. I'm the only one that knows it, though, Hannah. <laughs> uh, what, what are you trying to say, Fel? Whether it be a diamond Super Bowl ring or whether it be confetti, confetti that I treasure because my good friend Ken Langham thought about me on that important occasion where he got to experience the Super Bowl with his team. Treasures treasures you and I will not take them with us. When I pass and when I die, I'm not going to be clinging on to my Ziploc bag of confetti. So, brothers and sisters, what do I want to say to you? I want to say to you, ultimately, have an eternal perspective on treasures that God has given to you and realize that you can build God's kingdom through those treasures. I say that because I was once again uh, reminded this week that um, my rays get shorter and shorter and shorter. And I want to be faithful to finish. Paul tells us that everybody runs a race. We all run the same race. And it doesn't matter if you run, but what really matters is that you finish. You finish the race. Some of you need to hear this, okay? And, and, and I want to end our time together. <laughs> yes, that's my son. Can you ask yourself this simple question? How am I investing in God's kingdom? How am I investing in God's kingdom? I get this all the time because, well, Fel, I'm retired. No, I, I've already told you. Those of you that say that to me, please don't say it to me because I'm going to correct you. I'm going to say you're not retired. You're just, God's just using you in a different opportunity to 
get refired and get used again for his glory. Your greater days are today, not yesterday, by the way. But if you are retired, if you, if you aren't working a full-time job and there's 40 hours, guess what? Guess what God has given you an abundance of? Time. So I'm going to ask you, how are you investing in God's kingdom with your time? Let me give you a this isn't going to get people in, by the way. This isn't going to, but let me just, let me just drop a little nugget here, right? You know, there's a nursing home next to us. It's not a nursing home. It's a assisted living facility next to us. And every Sunday, uh, Pastor Abram goes and does a little devotion with them. You know what would be really good? If someone could help him and, and free him from that and someone else could lead that for us. And Mike and Stephanie does the first Sundays. What would, what would we do if we continue to do this, right? Let me, let me give you another nugget. You know what with the, one of the teachers at Frida Markley just asked me when I was there last week during their literacy we, we helped them with their literacy uh, like night with their parents she asked me she said pastor would you would you consider doing something like this I like I would like to have you or people who would, can come in on a, on, into my class and read to my students once a week or once a month. If I could have, I'm just thinking, wow. How long is that commitment going to be? Oh, 30 minutes? And I, I told you already, uh, I was telling my wife this. Every time I walk into Freedom Marketing and I see those kids, I'm like, my heart gets tugged. Because I'm looking at kids who need love, who need kindness, who need someone to just invest in them, care for them. 30 minutes to read to some kids. Any of you have 30 minutes in the week? I have a, I have a teacher at Freedom Markley who would love you. You could just read if you have time. Once a week. Talent. What talents do you have? that you could use? Could it mix the talent of reading and time be used for his kingdom and his glory? Could a talent of, of friendliness be used by hanging out with some older people? Young people, let me just say this. This is not just for the older people, this is for you. Because you know what? I know this. My mom loves when the younger siblings and the younger cousins show up because it just thrills her. And I know that older people love that. I'm going to challenge you. Let the Lord speak to you. Because I can tell you this. That's how we can use our talents. Man, I'm just thinking about all ways. Like, some of you guys have played the guitar. That'd be awesome. Play the guitar to a bunch of, do a sing-along with some of the older people. And, and uh, yeah, let the Lord speak to you. Treasures.
I, I don't like talking about money. I like talking about the heart. Because ultimately, when God has your heart, he has your money. So this morning, I'm going to ask you, how will you invest your treasures in God's kingdom? How will you invest your time and your talents in God's kingdom today? God has a plan for your life. God wants to spend your life to give him glory. And today, you don't know what God's plan is. He does. And he's wondering you and asking you to be a faithful steward. Be generous by simply obeying God's voice. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much today for your word. Thank you for uh, our time together as we talk about how do we make an impact in our world. And this morning, I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to the hearts of your people. What could a church like a mission church wholly commit themselves to doing? What incredible impact we could make for your kingdom and for your sake. Lord, I pray that today in Jesus' name.